good design is invisible. The best products disappear into everyday life. They even have the power to define an entire generation. In the mid 20th century, Braun was doing just that. Under the visionary leadership of Dieter Rams, Braun redefined consumer products for over 40 years. Rahm's commitment to simplicity and functionality directly shaped the look of modern electronics today. But there is one Braun creation that really caught my attention. One that I don't think many people, including myself, have ever seen before. The HL1 desk fan. Designed by Reinhold Weiss in 1961, this fan was an icon of the Braun products lineup. But if you want an original in mint condition, it's going to be a pretty steep price tag. And there's no fun in just buying one. And so that's how this project began. Today, 3D printing lets anyone design and create products that were once the exclusive domain of big industries. In just one day, you can take a fleeting thought or a sketch on a notepad and turn it into a working prototype. That said, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with 3D printing. It's a powerful tool, and it's the very reason I was able to make this video, but in my opinion, it also comes with a certain level of responsibility. And with these printers becoming more popular and more user-friendly, I've been seeing a lot more junk getting mass-produced by people with print farms. On one hand, I do understand people are just trying to make a living, but it's really hard for me to get behind when a lot of the stuff being sold is just low-quality toys made with low-quality plastic. So with this project, I wanted to show you that you can use 3D printing in a more intentional way. Making quality parts begins with the design. Keeping things simple is easily the most complicated thing to do when designing. It can be really hard to let something go that you spent a lot of time thinking about and working on. When designing 3D printed parts, I'm usually thinking about print orientation the most. I'm sure most people have seen a plastic snap hook before. So snap hooks are designed to slightly flex. And if you were to print the hook vertically, it's probably gonna snap immediately along the layer lines. But if you print it on its side, the layer lines are parallel to the flexing force and the hook is going to be a lot stronger. Another reason print orientation is so important is it determines how much support material you're going to use. I personally hate using supports and limit it as much as I can. One way I limit them is by breaking down complicated parts into assemblies. For the fan blades in this project, that's exactly what I did. Not only does this save on material, but it also allows me to change certain features without needing to print an entirely new part. I will say though, for this specific example, getting all the blades to line up and gluing them in was kind of a pain, but that's completely on me, and I'm sure there's people who could come up with a better solution. But if you're someone who's interested in designing 3D printed parts, just try to be very intentional with your design process and always consider the limitations of your machine.
There were a lot of challenges with the post-processing that I wasn't entirely prepared for. So I initially painted everything this brown color and sort of rushed through it. I had a lot shorter of a time frame in my head for this project and I was honestly just trying to get it done. But after putting it all together, I was really disappointed in the surface finish and just the overall quality. There were a lot of visible flaws and I just didn't love the color. The goal was to have a factory looking finish, so after sitting with my disappointment for a little bit, I took everything apart and started over. From this point, it took about two weeks to get all of the parts painted properly. And a quick side note, there are a lot of different ways to get a smooth finish with 3D printed parts. I used PETG filament, which doesn't have any options, but there are other plastics out there that you can get smooth with significantly less effort. Ideally for this, I would have used a resin printer, but all I have is my little Ender 3, so that's where we're at. I'll try and quickly summarize this process because I don't want to bore you with too much detail. The original brown paint acted as a base primer, and I took this time to touch up some of the imperfections caused by my printer. For that, I used some automotive body filler. After sanding the filler smooth, I started the painting process for the second time. It was a pretty repetitive process that didn't take a whole lot of effort, just a lot of time. And before applying the final coat, I wet sanded it up to 2500 grit just to get it as smooth as possible. If you're doing anything like this, take the 24 hour cure time with a grain of salt. I made the mistake of completely trusting that and accidentally had two parts basically weld themselves together. The main takeaway from the finishing process is that patience is the key to getting a proper finish, at least with spray paint. Oh, and I desperately need to get a new printer. The Ender 3 is slow and it requires a lot of tuning. I lost a lot of time in this project because of my printer consistently acting up. But that brings me to the final challenge of this project. I'm not exactly sure when I decided to make the base the same as the HL70, but I sort of wish I hadn't. Acrylic forming is something I've never done before and it took quite a bit of trial and error. I initially tried to do it all by hand using whatever I had, but to do it right, or at least somewhat right, I had to make a few tools. The first one was this hot coil for bending. When you apply a current to the coil, it heats up, ensuring you get an even and consistent bend line on the acrylic. It was fairly easy to make, but I'm not gonna go into that because there are plenty of videos out there and it's at least a little dangerous. For the curved piece, I made a negative mold out of plywood and just heated it up and pressed it in. And finally, I bonded the two pieces together using acrylic cement. You need to be pretty precise when applying it, and if you accidentally spill it on the acrylic, it will absolutely mess up the finish. And I definitely didn't spill any on my first attempt. But with the base finished, that pretty much wraps this project up. I won't lie, it really started to suck at some points, and it felt like there was an infinite amount of steps to get it completed. This project taught me a lot about patience and the importance of keeping your designs simple. With the very limited resources I had, I was able to create something that I will use for a very long time. And if something breaks, replacing parts won't be too hard since I'm the one who designed them. And while my version isn't an exact replica of the HL1 or HL70, I don't think the changes I made take away from the original design at all. My hope is that after watching this video, you see a slightly different side to 3D printing. One that's more focused on making real high quality parts that will stand the test of time.
If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. But that's all for now. See you next time. show you how this works. So I took this part from my tripod and I can just take it off with this by unscrewing this knob. But this basically clamps to the pipe. I can slide it along it wherever I want. And then this swings out because it is rotating on that. Go right here and just tighten it up. And then this doesn't move at all. Quick and easy little overhead camera mount.